Hi, my name is Chris. Welcome back to the shop. So the purpose of this video is to show you how this saw comes packaged, how to set it up, and how to tune this specific saw. Now this will be a little bit of a long form video. So if you have specific questions about what I'm going to talk about or about this saw, check down in the description and I'll have links to specific times. That way you can watch exactly what you're interested in. And I can give you the best information I can about this saw. If you want to see that, stick around. Now up front, I just want to do a, an FTC type disclosure. I had a, a little bit of a discount on the saw through Rikon and Woodcraft. Now they in no way influenced even me selecting this saw or this brand. But I spent my own money after looking at all of the saws um, available on the market. When I was deciding what saw to purchase, I was looking for the best saw I could in about the 10 inch category um, for my shop. I had some money saved up and my goal was to find the best small band saw I could I did uh, a lot of market research. I looked at pretty much all of the models and uh, decided that this Rikon 103061 was the best 10 inch bandsaw I could find for the money. So let's talk a little bit about the tools that you're gonna need to set up and tune this. So most of them come with it. In fact, there's integrated tool holders here on the back of the saw, which is a feature I really like for keeping the tuning tools right next to the saw. Um, but other than what comes with it, you're gonna need a utility knife, of course, for unboxing. You're going to need a number one Phillips screwdriver for adjusting uh, the gauges on the table. Uh, you're going to need some type of square, maybe two squares um, to use in tandem. This combination square is what I primarily used. I also used a small machinist square, but one isn't necessary. You can take one of these apart and use the, the small right angle that's machined into that portion of the square. You're going to need some general purpose degreaser. I used uh, WD-40 to get the, uh, the oil or cosmoline off the table. Of course, you're gonna need some rags to clean that off. And then not shown here is the, is uh, paste wax that you need to treat that raw cast iron surface once uh, you remove all the grease from it. Uh, also not shown is you're gonna need some kind of a spacer for tuning the, the blade uh, guides. Um, I actually used a piece of paper that came with the saw. You'll see it later in the video, but I just folded that paper to the appropriate thickness. And uh, a little tip, if you're buying the saw, you can use that or you can use a business card or a note card. Um, just make sure it's the appropriate thickness as you tune up your, uh, your blade guides. The saw comes with three manuals, one in French, English, and Spanish. Everything weighs around 80 pounds, so I found it was easier to just cut the box from around the saw. That is a big table for a small band saw like this. It weighs a solid uh, maybe 15 pounds. Once I got everything out of the packaging, I went through the manual. It's got a great section to help you familiarize yourself with the components of the saw. So I just took my time and learned as much as I could about the saw. Of course, I took a lot of notes of things that I thought you might want to know too, so that I could share them in this video. The next step was to degrease the cast iron table. For this I used some WD-40 uh, to dissolve the grease and some shop towels to absorb it. And then I just buffed it really well to get all the grease and oil off the surface. Immediately after degreasing, I used some uh, paste wax 
to coat the surface. I just rubbed on the wax, uh, got it into all the edges, and then allowed it to cure on the surface before buffing it off later. The next step in first row assembly step is to attach the table to the trunnion. Uh, the table is held in place with four bolts and they come with lock washers. These are first labeled in the bubble packaging and uh, they attach using the 10 millimeter wrench. It's also provided in the packaging. Before tightening everything down, I did a rough check to make sure that the uh, miter slot was square to the blade and uh, that the table was level. Next, I removed the table leveling screw from the packaging. This is a socket head cap screw with a thumb knob for uh, drawing the two halves of the table where the kerf slot is together. This keeps the table from uh, sagging and allows it to remain nice and flat across the surface. Next, I removed the thumb screws for the fence guide from the packaging. These are just two thumb screws and then the uh, fence rail was uh, packaged by itself. When I attached this, I just made sure that the gap was even between the table and fence guide all the way along the uh, edge of the table. Next, I assemble the fence. It's simply, uh, there's two T-slots on the fence that slide over two machine screws and then they tighten down with thumb screws. Uh, I had to do a little bit of adjustment with the fence. There's some nylon uh, set screws that you have to adjust to make sure the fence tightens down and glides smoothly on the rail. The next components to come out of the packaging is the fence holder. It uh, gives you a spot to store your fence when not in use up along the column of the saw. I think this is a really great feature. This just attaches with a couple of uh, Phillips screws. The final component to take out of the packaging and install is the blade tension knob. It simply slides into a hole on top of the saw and then there's two uh, ends of a roll pin that protrude uh, to allow it to tension the uh, blade tensioning assembly. Uh, I'm not really sure why this doesn't permanently attach but it's kind of nice that you can take it off. Uh, it makes the height clearance a little bit easier to adjust. And of course, well, the thing I really like about this saw is every single tool has its own place. So now we're going to transition into tuning the saw. You're going to need a box end wrench that comes with the saw, a small square, a uh, combination square, and a number one Phillips screwdriver, and either a business card or the folded piece of paper that we'll go over in a little bit. So the first step is to lightly loosen all four bolts so that you can adjust the table. Here you're just going to make sure that it's square with the blade. And uh, I did this by just measuring on either end of the table, um, keeping the square up against the blade, making sure that the distance was uh, approximately the same. Really band saw, you're only ever going to rough, uh, rip things anyhow. The next job is to check the table for square with the blade. Uh, with the blade under a little bit of tension, I just made sure that the uh, table was square and then adjusted the gauge uh, for zero or the 90 degree, degree position.
The next thing I'm gonna do is check the tracking before we tension the blade. You've got a slight window up above and down below here, and I'm just gonna manually spin it through some full cycles and watch the blade, and the blade shouldn't move back and forth on that wheel at all, and it shouldn't be too far forward or too far to the rear. What I'm seeing is the blade is, is approximately centered on the wheel, and it's not moving around a whole lot. Now, this can be adjusted also when the saw is running, but you want to rough it in before you really tune up the saw. All right, the next thing we're going to do is adjust the blade tension before we tune the blade guide. So I'm going to back off all of the blade guides. You can see that they're spring-loaded. I'm just going to get them away from the saw blade. So in the manual for the stock blade, it says that uh, you want it under tension to deflect approximately a quarter of an inch with this raised up and the guides not contacting the blade. So I've already got that tensioned, but this is how you would how you would adjust your tension. So you can see if I back off the tension, there it deflects even more. And I'm gonna go up in tension just a little bit. So you can see the, the blade guide has about a quarter of an inch away from the saw blade. So I want this tension such that I can just deflect it in the center to the point where it's gonna touch that blade guide. So up top, I should be able to force it over to contact that blade guy. And I've got about that amount of tension in it right now. And if you need a frame of reference, you just hold it there. The square's about a half an inch thick, so I shouldn't be able to deflect it more than half of the square. That seems like a pretty good tension there. So as we get started, the first thing you want to move is the entire blade guide assembly, okay? And you want to get the leading edge of the bearing to be about a sixteenth of an inch behind the gullets of the teeth. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and line that up first and then tighten it down because this moves where all of the bearings are positioned. Now the manual, manual specifies to use a business card or a 132nd inch spacer between the side guide bearings on the upper and lower guide blocks and to have the rear thrust bearing clear of the rear of the blade. Now I've got a business card here that's actually about a 64th um, thickness when I measured it or it's uh, 0.35 millimeters uh, for those of you in Canada and when you fold it in half I get a 32nd of an inch or 0.7 millimeters as a thickness here. So I'm going to use this as a spacer and uh, I'm going to start off by I actually uh, can't fit this in the way that this bearing block is to get the thrust bearing. And actually one design note I'd like to, to mention here, a lot of times you'll see a thrust bearing with its face uh, forward so that the blade contacts kind of the side of that bearing. Let me see if I can draw that real quick. A lot of times you'll see it so that uh, the bearing is facing forward so the blade actually contacts on the side of the bearing causing it to rotate. But in this design, You've actually got the bearing aligned in this direction, so the back of the blade contacts it in a more um, in a way that I think is actually going to preserve the life of that bearing for a longer uh, period of time. So I actually really like that design element. Okay, so I can't fit my business card in the back, so what I've done is I've actually taken from the same warning label and folded it over here. Let me see, I've got one, two, three. Four, one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 six. Gets me to one thirty second of an inch. So I'm going to use that as my spacer. And all I'm going to do is loosen this thumb screw here. And then you can see that the uh, this is spring loaded now. This this is a patented design. They have it on this as their smallest. Uh, the 3061 is the, yeah. The 103061 comes with these toolless bearing blocks and then uh, their larger Four model band saws come with them also. Um, this is one of the features I really liked about this because I, I do like to change blades frequently um, because I have a small shop I can't keep a saw set up for one operation necessarily so it's just a lot faster than to get it out on an Allen wrench and try to tune it that way. This this is outstanding this design and uh, I'm glad they were able to patent it. So now I'm just going to slide my spacer in here push this block forward without deflecting the blade at all I'll push it forward, hold that in position, and then just tighten the thumb screw down. Then to just test that setup is I'll spin the wheel, and as the blade passes, it shouldn't push on that thrust bearing, but then once you apply any kind of backward load to the blade, the bearing does contact it and spin. And what that does is it resists your, for your force as you're cutting, 
and keeps that blade from walking backwards or being able to move away from these um, side guide bearings. Okay, now that I've got the rear thrust bearing adjusted, I'm gonna do the two side bearings. Remember, this is a 32nd of an inch. I'm just gonna put it between uh, the blade and the bearing. Push on these little shafts here and uh, make sure that I don't deflect the blade at all when I'm adjusting this. And that's that. There's plenty of space between there and that's a well-tuned uh, set of guide blocks. Now, I'm going to do the lower. I'm going to do the exact same process on the lower guide blocks as I did on the upper. I'll tell you what, I am really liking this toolless guide block thing. This is something that can, you can spend uh, quite a bit of time with and quite often as you tighten these things, uh, especially with some of the different versions I've used where they rotate as they get closer and, and other odd designs like that. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, but often when you tighten it down, it'll move the setting and change it and it can be frustrating to adjust. So this toolless feature is slick, I'll tell you what. Now there's a little bit less clearance down below here, so I'm just going to use my little improvised one. Two, four, six, eight. There are eight thicknesses of this warning sheet that came, came with it. So I don't know what I said before. I might have said six, but there's eight layers of paper here from this thing. So you can make your own spacer by folding it over. And as I push in here, I'm just watching to make sure the blade's not deflecting. I just get it to the point where it holds the paper in place. And that's how I know I've got my spacing. Try not to block the camera angle. It's kind of awkward. I'm just going to move the saw here. Okay, now I've got this saw all tuned up and ready for its maiden run. So I just want to review the setup, what we did. First of all, we leveled the table and adjusted the miter gauge slot to parallel with the blade. Didn't take a whole lot of adjustment. Um, the second thing we did, which I didn't have to do, was track the blade. Um, what tracking is, is just aligning the blade so that it's centered on the wheels, top and bottom, and it doesn't move throughout the course of the the cycle. So that tracking knob is back here and had we had to make an adjustment, what it does is cancel the upper wheel and just allows the blade to center on that, that wheel. Uh, so that was an adjustment that was not required. Okay, so once we tracked the blade, then we adjusted the tension. Remember the quarter inch deflection with no guide blocks anywhere near it. I did a rough check of the tracking beforehand and found out I didn't really need to. Then I tensioned it and I confirmed the tracking. Okay, so we adjusted it square. We rough tracked, we tensioned the blade, and then we confirmed the tracking. Now that we have the blade where we want it to be, we can adjust the guide blocks so that they follow the blade. And that's where we went into all the adjustments, starting with the rear thrust bearings and then the side bearings on both the top and lower block. Now we've got everything, everything is tuned up and we are ready to fire up this saw for the first time. I have no idea what it's gonna sound like. It's got a uh, five amp half horse motor. We're set up for the fast setting on the speed stock. I am excited. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and drop the guard and guide blocks down a little bit. Everything's looking pretty good. All right, time to fire it up. It's pretty quiet. It, uh, it sounds pretty good. I don't know if you can hear that. Got my mic right here. All right. It's time to cut something. Just got a piece of three quarter inch Baltic birch here. Adjust this a little bit. All right, 
just steady pressure, putting it through the blade. About what you'd expect from a pretty coarse bandsaw blade. Not a horrible surface finish at all. And I'm gonna need to get my dust collection going. Plug it here, because this is not where this saw is gonna live. As you can see, uh, this height is too high on my bench. I prefer to work bandsaw uh, closer to my, uh, just slightly in between my waist and my chest height. So I'm gonna go ahead and mount my saw where my other one is there. And it'll take me a little bit to adjust things, but uh, I'm gonna record that for a separate video. And uh, thanks for watching the tune-up and initial cut. So next I'm gonna go through the owner's manual a little bit. I'll also put a link down in the description about it, but I was overall very impressed with this manual. It made setup and tuning an absolute breeze. So it's uh, a black and white manual. There's lots of detailed photos. Um, excellent product manual. It both introduces um, everything you need to know about the saw, about the safety requirements for operating the saw. It talks about how to tune and set up the saw. And uh, the, the step-by-step -step instructions are very easy to follow. There's not a whole lot of assembly to the saw. It's really just attaching and tuning the table, attaching the um, fence rail, and putting the fence itself together, and then just tuning up the blade guides, tuning up the bandsaw blade itself. But uh, just kind of run you through what all is contained within the manual. First of all, it talks about the specifications of the saw. Once again, I'm going to do a detailed video that's um, separate from this that talks about the saw's capabilities, details of the saw itself. This is just going to be a, a top level overview. So then it talks about the packaging and contents so you can inventory everything that comes with the saw. Uh, then it familiarizes you with the saw. It does a really good job of, of showing you all the components, telling you their purposes. Um, and then there's three pages of step-by-step -step assembly instructions with photos. Uh, and then there's another eight pages of tuning. So it, very detailed photos, very detailed instructions for how to get this saw tuned up perfectly. And then there's uh, additional sections for general operation, maintenance, and then three pages of troubleshooting um, for little issues you may have. There's also a full exploded diagram with a parts list in case you ever break anything or need to replace something. Um, which should make ordering replacement parts very easy. Overall, I was very impressed with the packaging. Um, everything arrived in good condition. Um, there is one manufacturing defect that I haven't addressed with customer service yet. There's a, a hairline crack that actually showed up uh, in the cast iron. But uh, this, this table is, uh, it looks like it's uh, horizontal surface ground. It's got a great surface finish on it. Um, very smooth. Typically that operation leaves the surface very flat. I haven't checked it for run out or anything, but the table is, is not only large for a small machine, but it, it seems to be very flat and it's definitely very smooth. So the last thing I want to do is go over the features of this saw, just kind of give you a general overview of it. I'll probably tell you my opinion on a couple of things, but I'm going to try to keep my opinion out of it and stick to just factual information about the features of this saw. So you've got a, a, a hand wheel up here for blade tension. Um, it, it just pops in, um, that way you can take it off if you need to get a little bit of height clearance. Um, you got the fence which stores right on the saw, I'm a big fan of that kind of feature. Um, the fence is a two position fence, it's got T slots here to where you can adjust it. Right now I've got it in the vertical position, but it also lays down in a horizontal um, position too. Uh, of course it just goes right on. Um, I actually need to, so one thing is these Delrin uh, or nylon, I'm not sure, yeah, I guess they're probably nylon. Bushings um, do have a tendency to walk their way in and out, so you may have to adjust that every once in a while. But there's the fence, I don't have it locked in. There we go. So there's the fence, it just slides on and off, and then it stores right on the saw. Here we've got uh, the top upper door spring loaded so it pops open and also holds it so it doesn't vibrate. Um, the wheels are cast iron, of course they're balanced. Um, here you can see the blade tension assembly. Uh, very rugged, this top plate is quarter inch, it looks like quarter inch steel. Um, the shaft is probably three eighths of an inch. And then there's a nice hefty spring in there for tensioning the assembly, just really well built there. And of course here's the lower cabinet. Um, Lots of dust, because I probably ran this without dust collection. Um, you got brushes for the wheels. There's your uh, 
for your belt. Uh, like I said, it's currently in the uh, fast speed setting. And you do have a dust port down below. Uh, we already talked about the cast iron table. Um, here's the throat, throat depth. I'm measuring nine and five eighths. The table itself is 12 and then five eighths inch deep by 13 and seven eighths wide. So it actually is slightly, I think, wider than the manual says. And then this fence guide is 16 and a half inches long. Here's your lockable on off switch so you can child proof that. So the column here is a uh, square tube steel. I don't know the gauge. Um, it seems like it's pretty thickness. I can't see a full wall thickness here, which is why I'm not sure because there's a cap on it. But the rest of the housing is constructed out of welded, uh, rolled and formed uh, sheet steel. And uh, it measures 2.54 millimeters in thickness. And uh, that's 3 seconds of an inch thick. So relatively thick. This saw is offered for sale in the US and I believe Canada. That's just based on what I saw on their website. And um, Rikon is based out of, I believe, Massachusetts. So kind of in the Northeast. But they distribute, uh, I think, primarily through Woodcraft stores. If you want to go see one before you buy it. Here, moving to the back of the saw, you can see a throw lever for uh, blade tension. That way you can completely remove the tension on the blade if you need to quick change a blade. You got a sight window here. There's also one down below for uh, blade tracking. Um, this is just where you open the cabinet. This is uh, your locking wheel and adjustment for your blade guides. And uh, this is extruded aluminum housing is, is pretty solid. Here's your tracking wheel and you've also got a locking knob for that. Um, here's the, the uh, tool storage I was telling you about. It comes with four Allen wrenches. Um, down below the motor, not shown, but it's, it's straight down underneath the table. It is a half horsepower uh, motor. It runs uh, 1720 RPMs and it's of course a 110 volt motor. Um, so <clears throat> those of us that operate on a, like a 20 amp circuit, um, have no problem operating this saw. Uh, it does pull five and a half amps um, and it's a, of course single phase. Blade length that this takes is 70 and a half inches and uh, its speed, it has two speeds that you can adjust the belt for. Uh, currently it's in the 3,280 3, feet per minute which is the high speed setting and then there's also a uh, 1,515 feet per minute setting. The capacities for this saw, it's got a five inch, and I think it's actually slightly higher than that, five inch high resaw capacity, and then the throat depth is nine and five eighths inches, or 244 and a half millimeters, and then this five inch dimension is approximately 127 millimeters. I'll also put this manual link, like I've already said, in the description, so you can go ahead and check it out and compare some of those features directly. If you're interested in uh, my shop setup, uh, I've got a lot of videos on optimizing a small shop. Currently, this whole setup that you see is in one half of a one car garage. I've still got some garage space that way and uh, material storage and things over there. But uh, it, this all fits in one car garage. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, be sure to hit that bell and subscribe so that you don't miss the detailed review uh, where I give you my candid feedback about this saw. Once again, Rikon is not influencing me at all um, on my opinion of this saw. But actually Woodcraft just ran a sale. Uh, they may still have it going um, where this saw is basically the same price I paid for it. I want you to know why I chose the tools that are in my shop. Anyhow, thanks for watching.